So, hello all, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Uh, so, uh, if you have any troubles at all, hearing me with the slides, whatever, please let us know because I, I won't know on my end unless you inform me. We're starting. Let's wait for a few more seconds. Please mute yourselves unless you have something to say or unless I specifically ask you a question. Through the lecture, I'm going to uh, randomly choose people from my sidebar and ask you questions. And whoever I invoke is supposed to answer. So let's begin. Uh, welcome to the spring 2022 edition of uh, Intro to Deep Learning. Uh, by now, if you have been following all of our uh, uh, here and suppose you've already been to the course website, which is deeplearning.cs.cmu.edu. If you haven't, please go there at once because all course objectives, logistics, quiz, homework policies, everything else are there. But you must have also been on Piazza where you've seen the logistics. Uh. Question? No, okay. So you must have always have been, must also have been on Piazza where you, where I made a logistics post yesterday. So please go there. And that is the last word on logistics. There is sticky. You will find it under the resources tab on Piazza. There's also a lecture, what, what we call lecture zero by Joseph, which is a bit long. You can, you can view it, but if you want the summary, uh, look at the logistics post. And it's very important for you to familiarize yourself with all of the information that is. Also, you should have signed on to Piazza. You should have verified that you have access to Canvas and AutoLab because if you're muted, can you guys just mute yourself, please? Okay. Just remember that this video is going online. So this video is going online. All the noises you make are going to be recorded for posterity and uh, everybody in the world will hear you. So remember that. Okay. Uh, you must also have verified that you have access to Canvas and AutoLab. Specifically, if you have been trying homework zero, you must have gotten, to, gotten onto AutoLab. There's a quiz zero. Again, these are not mandatory, but these are intended for you to check your background, your preparedness for this course. So if you've gone on quiz zero, that is on Canvas. Uh, you should have gone through the AWS uh, recitation. You should all be ready to work on AWS and CoLab. You've also received a note on forming study groups. Please form your study groups. There is an open thread on Piazza of people asking for team members. Please go through it. It's very important that you sign up for study groups immediately. If you don't do it, then we will, we will uh, assign study groups to you. We have posted forms for you to submit your study groups. Then the course philosophy. In our ideal world, every one of you is going to get an A, except you will earn it. We don't lower our standards. We work extra hard to make sure everybody of you is up to scratch. Someone uh, noted to me earlier today that the rumor is that anybody who has been through this course becomes a deep learning ninja. That really is our hope. I don't claim it's true, but if that's, if that's the uh, sentiment going around, I'm very happy for it. On our end, we are going to make sure that you have all the resources and the help available to be able to get an A. We have TAs, we, have, we are asking you to form study groups, collaboration is encouraged. We have dozens of office hours weekly. I'm always readily available and you are, you are not only allowed, you're encouraged to discuss the course and all contents and everything else with your classmates and friends. Also, uh, we have uh, made some uh, extra uh, resources for you if you are feeling under stress, feeling unable to cope, feeling that you're falling behind, worried about your grade, anything at all that bothers you. So if any of that happens to you, reach out to your TA mentor, to me. But we have a dedicated team for helping students under distress, consisting of Brad Warren, Aprajit Srinivasan, Mansi Purohit, and uh, Shreyas. So please reach out to these guys and we'll do our help best to help you. Oh my. Uh, the meeting capacity has been reached. This is bad. I'm not sure how to increase the meeting capacity. This is 
uh, because the meeting capacity was, uh, Urbil, do you know how to increase the meeting capacity over here? No, Professor, I'm just looking at it. Okay, so guys, if this lecture, I'll just count everybody as having attended. Uh, and like, if those who cannot make it to the Zoom, please uh, watch the video. So our course objectives, we have three primary objectives. You're, as part of the course, when you're done with the course, we expect you to be able to know something about the theory behind neural networks. Basically, we expect you to, we expect that we would have taught you some of the what, the why, and the how of neural networks, including the math, some of the history, and what you go through this will help you contextualize practical applications of neural networks. And that these will also help you develop and extend your ideas because you would have understood uh, the underlying concepts and the theory behind networks that you will be able to extend your ideas on the topic if you want to uh, go on to perform research or to grad school. More importantly, many of you are going to be looking for jobs. And in jobs, much of what we discuss in class, all the explanations we gave you, those things are gonna turn up in job interviews. So it's very important for you to actually attend all the lectures and attend the quizzes, regardless of you know, how interesting or boring you find them, they improve your job, up, job chances. Second, we teach you to build your own neural network components and tools. This is part of our course objective. Your homeworks have two parts, the part ones, are about you building your own tools from scratch and not depending on external toolkits. This is going to be required of you in many, uh, both in job settings and in research settings, regardless of whether you're going to grad school or whether you're going to work for a company, this is going to be expected of you. And last but not the least, we teach you to work on large scale problems, which are the part twos of your homeworks where you will compete with your uh, classmates on Kaggle. And again, the idea here is that you learn to approach a large problem, use standard toolkits and figure out how to implement solutions and make them work. So all three of these are part of your course objectives. Those of you in 685 and 785 also have a course project. These may relate to any of the first three objectives. My lecture style is verbose. I say a lot, there's a lot of visualization and I use lots and lots and lots of slides. I've heard complaints about this in the past, but then I've also heard a lot of thanks. And while this style works for some people, it doesn't work for other people. Personally, given a choice between deriving an equation on the board with math versus explaining it with 30 slides of pictures, which some of you might find redundant, I choose the latter because I believe the visual explanations work better for the majority of students. So if you don't like that kind of for our lecture style, this course is not for you. Just warning you in advance. Also, we expect attendance. So we're gonna use in-class polls to verify attendance. Even during this lecture, I'm gonna be posting a bunch of polls. During in-person lectures, polls will be posted on Piazza. On, in Zoom lectures, the polls will be posted on Zoom. You must respond to all the polls. We are not scoring you on correctness only on whether you responded because that indicates that you are present and at the least paying enough attention to know that a poll has been posted. And some of you are in bad time zones. And today, of course, we have maxed out our Zoom capacity. So those, those of you who are not able to actually attend the in-person class are uh, requested to watch the videos instead. The videos are gonna be put up on MediaTek or Panopto, we'll post the information, but you will also have the video links on the course page. Uh, we encourage you to check the videos on MediaTek because we can gather your attendance from there. Finally, this is a very interactive class. We like questions. Do not be embarrassed about your questions. It doesn't matter how basic, how silly or stupid you think your question is, it is not silly, stupid or wrong for the simple reason that if you haven't understood something, if you have a doubt, if you find something unclear, there are 400 students in class, the likelihood is there are at least another 100 students who have the same question as you. So it doesn't matter what your question is. 
It is never silly. It is never embar embarrassing. It's never foolish. Your question is important. Please ask it. Uh, so, uh, uh, so Jajan, those who are not able to, for this meeting, I'm just going to give everybody attendance for this class because we are having Zoom problems, right? Uh, but ask them to watch their video, watch the video afterwards. Also, during the course, we're going to keep trying different tactics to encourage interaction. So for example, in the in, during in-person classes, we'll be giving you little numbers and I'm going to randomly call out numbers and people who have those numbers must answer the question. Again, this is to make sure that you're paying attention and uh, not having an answer is not a bad thing. I don't know as an acceptable answer. Very often I will ask you questions for which there may be no answer and where I'm expecting you to think on the spot and you may not be able to come up with an answer. That is fine. Again, don't be embarrassed about wrong answers. Be embarrassed about not paying attention, right? Please participate, your participate enters the class. Now, uh, this is not for Zoom, but when we have in-person classes, I expect you to keep your smart devices, your phones and laptops shut, except to answer polls or to view lecture slides or to take notes. If we find you using your devices for any other purpose in the classroom, I'm going to ask you to leave the classroom. Again, just a warning, right? And this should not be here. This slide should not be here. But I have had comments about my mannerisms on in my FCEs and physically handicapped. My back is bent, my neck is bent. I cannot raise my arms. On some days I cannot walk. And when I'm lecturing at about the 40 or 50 minute point, I run out of breath because my lungs are compromised. So if my microphone falls off my lapel, Someone has to clip it on for me. I can't do it. I'm going to ask my TAs to do it. I use things like plastic swords and light devices to point to things because they're light. I can't raise my arm. If you find these offensive, please keep that thought to yourself. I cannot help it. So keep that in mind. Finally, now that we're at the end of that portion of the lecture, do we have any questions? Any questions? Okay, so if all of, how many of you have actually, no, so uh, we have, the class is supposed to be in person, but for the first two weeks of the semester, we have been moved to Zoom, which is why I'm slightly unprepared because I prepared my lectures, assuming we'd be in person. Uh, but, and so depending on the COVID situation, we may or may not move back into class, but at the earliest opportunity, I hope to be in class. That's the best experience. Also, uh, if you have, and those of you who have actually watched the, the, the logistics, uh, uh, seen the logistics post, please raise your hands so I can count. So that's, that's about a third of the class. Again, so if you have not seen the logistics post on Piazza, please get on Piazza at once and go through the logistics post immediately. There's a lot of information there. You can post your questions there and I will answer. All right, let's start. So today's lessons, today's gonna to be the introductory lecture. It's a brief history of neural networks. I'm warning you in advance or that this lecture is likely to run over a little bit because again, I wasn't prepared for Zoom. This has been thrust on us. Otherwise I would have a script and my, my lecture would be timed. Anyway, we're going to go through a brief history of neural networks about connectionism, its relation to cognition and the brain, how it contrasts to conventional computer architecture, and we're going to introduce modern neural networks and what they can compute. So here's the story. Here's why we are all here in this class. Neural networks have basically taken over AI. They have been successfully applied to various pattern recognition, prediction, and analysis problems. In many problems, they have established the state of the art, often exceeding previous benchmarks by very large margins, 
and sometimes solving problems that you simply could not solve using earlier machine learning methods. If you just look around you at uh, the various AI solutions that have come up, you will find many of them were simply not feasible with older methods. So here are some old examples at this point. We've been trying to build automatic speech recognition systems since the 1950s. And yet, in 2015, if you try to use Siri using your voice, its responses were more often humorous than useful because speech recognition simply did not work. And then, and I think this is 2016, Microsoft had this post where they showed that for the first time on a specific task, automatic speech recognition systems were able to outperform human beings in the task of speech recognition. These days on most tasks, your automatic system is going to be better than you at recognizing speech, believe it or not. And this was made possible using neural networks. Same thing with machine translation. In October 2016, if you put some English text into Google Translate, which was the best translation system at the time, converted it to Spanish, took that Spanish and put it back in and converted it back to English, what went in and what came out would not even be close. We used to use this thing more as, uh, as entertainment than as a useful product. And then in November 2016, observe the date 2016, Again, right. Suddenly, Google Translate became not just useful, but so good that even professional translators would use it to make the first cut of the translation. What happened? We began using uh, we, we began using neural networks. Here's another example. I got this picture of the web, so I can't attest to the veracity of this specific picture but this kind of performance is readily achievable using neural networks. In this image, a uh, neural network has detected, segmented, and classified almost every single object in the image. It's astonishing how accurate it is. It's, uh, if I asked you to do it, uh, you wouldn't be able to do it perhaps with the same level of precision that this has, human, human, bag, human, building, building, push cart, it got the, the, the bicycle, it got the lady on the bicycle, it got her bag. It's paying attention to everything. And uh, this kind of performance is simply not achievable use, without using neural networks or games. For the longest term, time, it was considered, the, the pinnacle of AI was considered to be intelligent games like chess and Go. And people imagine that computers would never beat humans at these games. Then in the late 80s, early 90s, computers finally caught up with human beings on chess. In fact, that happened right here at CMU. The first computer to uh, uh, beat a human grandmaster at chess was a PhD thesis in the School of Computer Science. Uh, Victor Anantraman, Thomas Anantraman, and another guy, I forget, both of who went to IBM later and built Deep Blue, which beat uh, Gary Kasparov. But then for 20 years afterwards, Go still remained unbeatable because in chess, there are 10 raised to 120 possible game states. In Go, there are 10 raised to 160 possible game states. And nobody actually came up with a computer game that could beat humans until this happened in 2016 again. Alpha Zero beat the world champion at the time at Go. And things have improved. These days, you can download a, one of these programs from the web, and it can begin to learn to play, play Go from scratch without knowing the rules. And it plays itself. And in a matter of a couple of days, it can learn to beat the smartest human player. And all of these was achievable. This was achievable only because we switched to using neural networks. Or oh, here's another one. Again, I'm showing you examples from 2016 because that's about when we had this phase transition. Uh, here are various images and uh, every image has been captioned. So the picture to the top left says, man in black shirt is playing guitar. Construction work, worker in orange safety vest is working on a road. 
two young girls are playing with a Lego toy. Well, maybe this is not a young girl, but you get the idea, right? Boys doing backflip on wakeboard. So every one of these is pretty accurate. Black and white dog jumps over a bar. And these captions, believe it or not, were entirely generated by a neural network. And modern neural networks are much better than these at, at captioning pictures. And it's not just things like playing games or classification or recognition. Neural networks have even become good at imagining, at creativity. So here are all of these faces. These were generated in uh, 2019. Uh, the latest techniques are even much better. They are, these, these are pictures of people uh, who don't exist. These were fantasized by a neural network. And you can see they're probably at least as good as a human painter could have created, right? So, uh, and there are other things from art to astronomy to healthcare, even predicting stock markets, neural networks have basically taken over AI. So what are these neural networks? In each case, it's this magic box where something goes in and something comes out. A voice signal goes in, it's transcription comes out. An image goes in, a caption comes out. A game state goes in, the next game predicted game state comes out. So the question now is what's inside the boxes that does this? To understand, we have to start from this point. Every one of these tasks that we saw so far, like recognizing speech, uh, captioning images, playing games, these are intellectual games. These, you don't see animals out in the field or insects performing these actions. These are all powered by the intelligence of the human brain. So to understand how to perform these, maybe the first place to look is the human brain itself. And even before that, at this act of cognition. Human beings are amazing at one thing, at thinking and uh, processing information. Here are the things we can do. We can learn, we can solve problems, we can recognize patterns, we can create, we can cogitate. You can simply be having a shower with no additional stimulus coming in and thinking and create your next great piece of art or your next great algorithm. So you're able to even cogitate without explicit stimulus. So these are the, uh, the, uh, the abilities of the human brain that we would like to emulate. But then how do humans actually achieve all of this? The problem is this. As Marvin Minsky said, if the brain was simple enough to be understood, we would be too simple to understand it. But then that hasn't stopped us from trying. And so for thousands of years, people have been trying to understand the human brain. In fact, the history, the first recorded history of people coming up with models for cognition goes back to 400 BC, Plato. So does anybody recognize this picture? Anyone? I know so, it's a Renaissance painting, and then the middle you have Plato and Aristotle. So Plato's pointing up, and Aristotle's gesturing down. Yeah. So yeah, this is the School of Athens, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you have Socrates and Plato in the middle, and you have uh, a whole number of other scientists of the his, historic and current scientists of the time from the 1500s in this picture. Anyway, so Plato over here came up with this original idea of associationism, and that idea persisted until 1900 AD. Uh, the, one of the most famous proponents of this idea was Ivan Pavlov. We are all familiar with this experiment where he made a dog salivate. So the idea here is that cognition, the process of, of making inferences happens through association and that the brain forms associations between percepts and that's what it uses to come up with whatever conclusions it comes up with. For example, what is an association? Every time you see lightning, you hear a thunder, right? So that's, after you've experienced this a few times, you begin associating lightning with thunder. And then later, if you see a lightning, you expect thunder. 
Or, and conversely, if you hear a th hear thunder, you think, ah, oh, lightning must have just struck somewhere nearby. So you form this association. And this sort of persists across all kinds of, uh, all kinds of uh, inferences that we make. S and the idea that we actually work through associations is a very powerful one. And in fact, even modern machine learning at the core of it all ends up being an associationist approach. But what is more important is sure, we agree that everything is done through associations, but where are the associations stored? And how are they stored? This is something that nobody really knew till about the mid 1800s. By the mid 1800s, a microscopy became sufficiently uh, powerful that we were able to study the brain and figure out that the brain is a giant mass of interconnected neurons. And so basically it consists of many, 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 many neurons. Each neuron connects out to many other neurons and each neuron is connected into by many other neurons. So these neurons form a giant network. And there must be something about this that enables it to store associations. And so the first person who actually came up with the hypothesis that the information about associations was stored in the connections between the neurons was this guy, Alexander Bain. Like all people of the day, back in the day, he was a polymath, he was a philosopher, he was a psychologist, he was a mathematician, he was a logician, he was a linguist. And last but not the least, he was a professor. And back in the 1800s, being a professor was a very big deal. It was much harder to be a professor then than it is now. And so in 1873, he came up with this theory that the information that the brain stores lies in its connections. He published this idea in this book called Mind and Body in 1873. Not only did he come up with a hypothesis, he even came up with computational models. So here is one of his examples. Here you have a little circuit. It gets three inputs and it gets has three outputs. And it, because of the manner in which these neurons have been connected, the neurons are shown by the circles, the different inputs result in different outputs. For example, if A and B are high, then X is high. If A and C are high, then Z is high. If B and C are high, then Y is high. So the one circuit, but different inputs will result in different output patterns. Now, this seems like a very obvious thing to us these days, but back in back when uh, Bain suggested it, it was anathema, people was kind of startled and didn't quite believe him. So he even came up with these more interesting models where the same circuit could result in different outputs based on the intensity of the input. Here, for example, if the input is low, then Y, which gets three copies of it, will fire, but X, which only gets two copies, will not. On the other hand, if the input is high intensity, both will fire. So uh, just the single circuit can have different outputs, not just based on the input patterns, but on the intensity of the inputs. And he even proposed a me mechanism which said, explained how the brain could actually form these connections that store associations. He said, when two impressions concur or closely succeed one another, the nerve currents find some bridge or place of continuity, better or worse, according to the abundance of nerve matter available for the transition. So this is basically predicting heavy and learning which wasn't formalized by Donald Hebb until 1945. So here is the history. Computational models, what we call artificial neural networks were first proposed in a form that we recognize back in 1873. That's how old this technology is. The problem was that, you know, as Bertrand Russell states, the fundamental cause of the trouble is that in the modern world, the stupid are cocksure, while the intelligent are full of doubt. And so in 1873, Bain postulated that there must be one million neurons and five billion connections between them 
in order to acquire 200,000 percepts. But then he began worrying 10 years later that he hadn't taken into account the number of partially formed associations and the number of neurons that would be required to, to actually compose the, the totality of knowledge through these partially formed associations. And eventually by the end of his life in 1903, he sort of agreed with all of his detractors and said, nah, our brain is too small. This model doesn't work. It's just, that simply doesn't explain how associations could be stored in the brain. It would require too many neurons and too many connections. The problem was he was right the first time around and the wrong the second time around. In fact, the brain has about 80 billion neurons, the average brain, and it has about 100 trillion connections. There's more than enough capacity in the brain to store everything brain, brain thought of and a whole lot more, which is why we function. And the brain does indeed operate the way Bain suggested. The human brain is a connectionist machine. Neurons connect to other neurons, and the processing capacity of the brain is a function of the connections between the neurons. What the neuron stores and what it can process depends on how they are connected, connected to one another. And so connectionist machines emulate the structure. And so here is the core idea of a connectionist machine. A connectionist machine is a network of processing elements. All world, the individual elements themselves are very simple. They're not complex. All world knowledge is stored in the connections between these very simple elements. So this is fundamentally different from the standard architecture for computer processors that we use today. Does anybody know what the standard, what the uh, architecture for modern computers is? Anybody remember? Now oh, wait, how many of you have heard of the von Neumann architecture or Harvard architecture? Raise your hands. How many of you have heard of von Neumann architecture? So a good number of you have, right? So uh, can one of you who has heard of it tell me what the von Neumann architecture is? Anyone? So Yu Yen says, yep, data and program are separated. So what happens in the von Neumann architecture or its uh, downstream derivatives like the Harvard architecture is that you have a processor which is separate from the memory. Data and programs are stored in the memory. So because the processor is fixed and the the operations of the processor are only dependent on the contents of the memory in order to make the same processor perform different operations. All you need to do is to change the contents of the memory, which is why your smartphone, your single smartphone can do so many things. You have one processor, but then you have hundreds of different programs in the memory and depending on which one you invoke, it does something different. Dural networks, connectionist machines are not like that. They're very different. In the connectionist architecture, the, the, the uh, program is the processor because the program is encoded in the connections between the units. If you wanted to run a different program, you have to change the entire processor. You have to build a new computer with new connections, which is why we don't actually build hardware neural networks these days we emulate neural networks on the von Neumann and Harvard architecture machines because those are far more flexible. And so here's the recap of everything we've seen so far. Neural network-based AI has taken over most AI tasks. These originally began as computational models of the brain or more generally as models of cognition. The earliest model of cognition was associationism. The more recent model of the brain is connectionist. Neurons connect to neurons and the workings of the brain are encoded in these connections. Current neural network models are connectionist machines. So now there's a poll. Orville, can you pull up the poll? Yeah, you have a poll, guys. And you have 
He has two questions. You have 45 seconds. Okay, five seconds, guys. Let me start this. So, that's, maybe I spoke too fast, but again, I, the connectionist model as proposed by was, as we just spent 10 minutes explaining was, originally proposed by Alexander Bain. Not Aristotle came up with associationism. I haven't even mentioned Turing or Hartley. And uh, as I just explained, the brain has 80 billion neurons, but it has 100 trillion connections between the neurons. Uh, whereas, whereas uh, Bain imagined that he would require 1 million neurons and 5 billion connections to hold all the percepts he thought. What we actually have far, far exceeds his original uh, hypothesis. We have 80 billion neurons, but the answer to this question is 100 tr trillion because we have 100 trillion connections. Anyway, uh, so moving on, any questions? So Chinmay Gar, in terms of uh, building hardware, physical neurons, that's a, that, in terms of power and a whole lot of other, other stuff, yes, there would be uh, advantages and people do work on this problem. But then the uh, 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 you know, disadvantages are far greater. The flexibility, you, you kind of you cannot, you know, it's uh, a fixed program, right? So those of you who do not have questions, please lower your hands so that if you, if you raise your hands, I can make out that you have a question, right? Uh, okay. Uh, so here is where we are. Connectionist machines are networks of processing elements. All world knowledge is stored in the connections between the elements. The individual elements themselves are very simple. So what are these individual elements that make these very powerful machines? So to answer this question, we're gonna go back and look at the brain itself. In the brain, the individual elements are the neurons. And here's what a neuron looks like. It has a head called the soma, which has lots of little tendrils through which signals come in. These are called dendrites and signals come in from other neurons through these tendrils. Then it has this long leg, which is covered in a little fat sheath called the myelin sheath. So this long leg is called the axon. And then from the out, outer end of the, these, these fibers going out outside the axon, that's how uh, it, uh, it connects to other neurons. Now, here's something that uh, you may or may not know. If this, axon, if this little protection around the axon breaks down and the neuron cannot function, so the ability of the neuron to operate depends heavily on the health of this myelin sheath, the, the fat sheath that surrounds the axon. And it actually turns out that uh, how smart a person is may in fact depend on the availability of these glial cells that form this fat. So the more fat you have in your head, the more likely you are to be smart. They've actually done this uh, study on Einstein's brain. They found he has the same number of neurons and connections as everybody else, but he has had a lot more fat in his head. So uh, if somebody calls you a fat head, that's actually a compliment because they're calling you smart. And another factoid that may only interest me, neurons don't undergo cell division. They cannot because the connections between the neurons, so this goes back to the hardware aspect, right? The connections between neurons are what store information. If a neuron underwent cell division, then the connections break down and all that information is lost. So neurons do not undergo cell division. When you get new neurons, this occurs through neurogenesis that produces new neurons from neuronal stem cells. 
And this happens most until birth and after birth you produce very few new neurons. Anyway, so we're gonna model the basic unit of connectionist machines on the biological neuron. And the first people to come up with the model are these guys, Mekalo and Pitts. Mekalo was, uh, Warren Mekalo was a neurophysiologist in the uh, University of Chicago. Walter Pitts was actually a homeless hobo at that time. We just knocked on Mekalo's door and Mekalo invited him in and they, 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 Pitts stayed with Mekalo and they worked on Wonder of Wonders, uh, the brain, right? So if I were to ask you, which of these is Mekalo and which of these is Pitts, can anybody tell me? Anyone want to take a guess? Pitts is on the right, <laughs> Mekalo is on the left. So Mekalo is on the right and Pitts is on the left. Uh, so he, anyway, Mekalo was much older than Pitts. But anyway, these guys, they went on to came, come up with this model uh, which is the basis of everything that we do in neural networks these days. This is the original paper, Mekalo and Pitts, 1943, a logical calculus of the ideas imminent in nervous activity. Pitts was 20 years old when he wrote this paper, only 20. So here is the model. It has, according to this model, the neuron has a head and it has incoming connections from other neurons. The incoming connections come up two types the excitatory connections, the synapses, through which information is transmitted into the neuron from the other neurons. And then the inhibitory synapse, if there's any signal on this inhibitory synapse, then this neuron will not fire. But if there are signals coming in here, then if the, the again, I forgot to mention how the biological neuron works. In the biological neuron, you have a number of connections, you have a lot of signals coming in from other neurons. If the total signal exceeds some threshold, then this neuron fires. I mean, this is an approximation to the actual operation. And the firing of that neuron goes down this long axon to other neurons. That's how the biological neuron works. So this model too emulated this. If the total signal coming in from through these excitatory synapses exceeded a threshold, then the neuron would fire unless there was any signal on the inhibitory synapse. If there was an inhibitory signal, it would not fire. Now, using this simple model, you can compose all kinds of really complex uh, operations. You can, for one, you can construct all Boolean gates. So in this case, you have a neuron uh, and it has a connect, neuron two has a connection from neuron one and neuron one connects through, through, styles, through synaptic connections. So anytime neuron one fires, neuron two is going to get two inputs. And neuron two will fire if it has, if the total number of inputs equals or exceeds two. So that means every time neuron one fires, neuron two will fire, but after the amount of time taken for the signal to come from here to here. So this is just a little delay. Now here's this one. Here, once again, neuron two is going to fire if the total number of inputs is two. So, what kind of Boolean gate is this? Can anybody guess? That's an AND, it's right? An or. It's, it's an OR, exactly. I'm sorry, it's not an AND, it's an OR, right? Because if either one or two fire, then they, it's going to get two copies. And because the threshold is two, this will fire. Now this guy over here, this is an AND. Again, this needs two copies of the input to fire. I mean, a total of two inputs to fire. So unless both one and two fire, it's not going to receive two inputs. And so this is an end. This one's a little more complex. This will fire if one is firing, but two is not firing because two has an inhibitory connection, right? So this is one and not two. So at least two, but the answer here is at least two. Now, they also showed using this uh, little neuron that you can come up with very interesting uh, circuits that explain, that, that emulate biological phenomenon. For instance, in real life, if you touch something that's very cold, very briefly, your instant sensation is not going to be cold, it's going to be heat. Uh, on the other hand, if you keep it touched for an extended period of time, you will sense heat. So here's how they came up with a circuit to explain it. 
suppose you just touched a cold very briefly. Then after one time instant, the blue signal would fire. At the zeroth time instant, the cold receptor fires. At the first time instant, the blue fires. At the second time instant, something more interesting happens. So if, if the cold, cold sensation is very, yeah, we assume that it needs two inputs to fire. So if the cold sensation is very brief, then at the first time instant, the lower line will have a high, but the upper line will have a, have a zero. So the cold sensor will not fire. But if the cold sensation persists, then at the first time and second time instant, the cold receptor will still have a one. And the delayed receptor, which is the blue dot, will also have a one because it's responding to, the, uh, to a delayed version of the signal. And so the cold sensor will actually get two inputs and it will fire. On the other hand, if you have a very brief cold sensation, then after one time instant, the blue fires. After two time instants, the red fires. After two time instants, the cold is already sort of quiet. So there's no other signal coming in. So the inhibitory response over here is no longer uh, doing anything. So after two time instants, the red one will fire. That will activate the heat sensor. And so if your cold sensation is very brief, you're going to sense heat, but not cold. But if the cold sensation is continuous and persistent, then the cold one will fire. And because the persistent cold sensation is going to inhibit this red neuron, the heat one will not fire. So this little circuit actually explains very, very neatly a little biological phenomenon. So they had a pretty powerful model, but then they overstated things. They claimed that the nets should be able to compute a small class of functions, that if a tape is provided, the nets can compute a richer class of functions, and they said it would be Turing complete. And you can show that this is a finite state machine. It cannot be Turing complete. And they really didn't prove any results. They showed how you could construct circuits, Boolean circuits, uh, on various kinds of circuits with this uh, unit. But they didn't provide a mechanism to figure out how to, how to construct the circuits. So they said it's possible, but they didn't actually have a construction mechanism. For that, we had to wait to, for Donald Hebb. So Donald Hebb was another polymath. He was a, he was a novelist. He, at some point, he became a hobo. Then he became a school teacher. Then eventually gave it all up and became a psychologist at Harvard. So in his book on called Organization of Behavior in 1949, he actually proposed this learning mechanism, which has a very long text explaining it. But basically it says that if a neuron A is connected to a neuron B, if A and B repeatedly fire together, then the connection between the two will become stronger. Otherwise, it doesn't change. So he succinctly stated, he said neurons that fire together, wire together. So here's how it works. Neurons don't actually directly touch each other. When one neuron connects to another, the first neuron has this little ax axonal connection from the axon, which has a bulb at the end of it. The receiving neuron, the dendrite, has a little connector. And these two are pretty close. So anytime the first neuron fires, it emits some chemicals, which go and excite the second neuron. Now, uh, so what was the question over here? What's the difference between cold and heat? Cold is touching ice, heat is touching a star, right? Uh, anyway, so what happens is if the first neuron fires and this causes the second neuron to fire, then that head becomes larger. That means the next time around the first neuron fires, more chemicals are emitted and it becomes easier for the second neuron to fire. So if neuron X repeatedly triggers neuron Y, this bulb called the synaptic knob gets larger and it becomes easier for neuron X to trigger neuron Y. So if I assign a weight to the connection between the two neurons, you get this rule, Wxy, which is the connect weight of this connection. After each episode, of, after each interaction between the two neurons, Wxy equals Wxy plus eta times xy. If x fires and y fires, then xy is going to be one. Eta is a small positive number. So every time the two of them fire together, this weight of the connection keeps increasing. Now, can somebody tell me what's wrong with this thing? 
Uh, will the condition ever decrease? It never decreases, right? And so this is fundamentally unstable. Stronger connections will continue to enforce themselves. But if you wait long enough, every connection is going to get stronger and eventually you're going to have a massive meaningless circuit. There's no notion of competition. There's no reduction of weight and the learning is unbounded. So this learning, which is called the Hebbian learning rule, you're going to encounter it again and again. It's a pretty valid rule, except that it's fundamentally unstable. It needs some changes. So there were several modifications proposed to it, like generalized Hebbian rule and various others. I won't go over those, but uh, in order to try to make it work, but the basic rule itself remains unstable. So here is the second pole. Why is the second pole not showing up here? All right, it's five seconds, guys. Okay, everybody knows the answer, right? It's fundamental, the Hebbian learning is fundamentally unstable because there is no reduction, right? So uh, we need a change. So the next update came from this guy, Frank Rosenblatt. He was a psychologist, he was a logician. Uh, he invented in his opinion, the solution to everything, also called the perceptron in 1958. So uh, the slides have more information on his model, but here is his basic model. This is also a model for the neuron, but then he says that the neuron has this structure over here that every, all the neuron receives many inputs. Each input has associated with it a weight. And so the, eventually the neuron receives a weighted sum of all of these inputs. If the weighted sum exceeds a threshold, it the neuron fires. If it, so meaning it outputs a one. If it doesn't exceed the threshold, then it outputs a zero. Alternately stated, if the difference between the weighted sum of inputs and the threshold is positive, the neuron fires, otherwise it doesn't fire. But then, uh, he, so he not only came up with this model, as we'll see in a couple of slides, he also came up with the learning mechanism where the learning mechanism had a minor modification over the Hebbian rule. And the modification was that the weights were now updated, not based on just the output, but on the notion of an error between a desired output and the actual output. So we'll see that in a minute. More importantly, here's what, uh, Frank Rosenblatt uh, sort of hypothesized. He thought this little circuit, just this little thing unit, which he called the perceptron, could represent any Boolean circuit. So, and he managed to convince a whole lot of people. So here are some quotations from newspapers of the time. The embryo of an electronic computer that the Navy expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself and be conscious of its existence. Frankenstein monster designed by the Navy that thinks. And this little unit, that was supposed to be it, that was supposed to do all of these, this little piece of logic. And here was the learning rule that uh, Rosenblatt came up with, which makes sense. Now, if you'll remember, in the Hebbian learning rule, the weight was adjusted by the product between y and x. If x was high and y was high, it uh, the weight adjusted. But here you introduce the notion of a desired output, what you want the neuron to output. And if at any point the desired output is the same as the actual output, you want a, want a one and the output is also one, there's no need to adjust the weight. On the other hand, if the desired output is a zero and the output is a one, you want to decrease the weight. If the desired output is a one and you output a zero, you want to increase the weight. It makes sense, right? And so his uh, his learning rule, he came up with this learning rule and he proved that this learning rule can in fact give you weights that will provably separate linearly separable classes. Meaning 
if you have data which lie on two sides of a plane and where the output is supposed to be one for one side and zero for the other side, this unit can do it. And you can see that this little unit can in fact model all kinds of Boolean gates. So for example, this guy here, the th again, the weight of each connection is shown on the line. The threshold that must be matched is shown in the circuit, in, say, in the circle. Can anybody tell me what this leftmost figure is? What is that? It is one and a one. There's an and, a not, and an or, right? There's an and, there's a not, and an or. You guys nailed all three. So here, both have, only if both are one, x and y are one, is the total input one. So x and y must both be one for this to fire. Here, if x is one, the actual input is minus one, which is less than zero, so it won't fire. But if x is zero, the input is zero, it will match the threshold and it will fire. So this is a not. Here, if either x or y are one, then the total input is one, which matches the threshold, it will fire. So this is an R. Unfortunately, this little circuit, this little unit cannot compute an XR. This was what Minsky and Pappert showed. So uh, unlike what Frank Rosenblatt thought, this little gate is not a universal Boolean machine. It cannot model every Boolean circuit. The simple XR, it fails. So what we found, what Minsky and Pappert showed in 69 was that individual elements are weak computational elements. They are, they can, what they can actually perform is very restricted. You need networked elements. Meaning if I begin connecting multiple of these guys, then the whole contraption becomes much more powerful. So here, for example, if I connect these three neurons, uh, three of these perceptrons, I can compute the XOR. This perceptron computes X or Y. This second perceptron computes not X or not Y. This perceptron computes the AND of both of its input. The result is a, an XOR. And so by connecting three of these perceptrons, I can compute an XOR. Now here we introduce them terminology. The final output we want is just the output of this final perceptron. The, Outputs of these individual intermediate guys are kind of uh, not really that important. We are only interested in the actual output. So these guys, even if we didn't see them, it wouldn't matter. So we call these the hidden neurons, the neurons behind the scene that actually get the job done. So we call this layer of neurons here, the hidden layer. Now, once you realize that you can begin connecting these neurons and compose Boolean circuits, you realize you can compose all kinds of Boolean circuits, right? For example, now I can compute a Boolean circuit using perceptrons, which computes this really ugly function out here. So you can compose arbitrarily complicated Boolean functions. In cognitive terms, you can compute arbitrary Boolean functions over sensory inputs. So a um, connection of a network of perceptrons, what we will call a multi-layer perceptron. Again, it's called a multi-layer perceptron because there are many layers of these per perceptrons that are being connected. This is a universal Boolean function. What we mean by this is that you give me a Boolean function and I can compose a network of perceptrons that will compute it. So uh, a multi-layer perceptron is a universal Boolean function. So the story so far is that neural networks began as computational models of the brain. They're connectionist machines, uh, which means they're networks of simple neural units. The Mekelo and Pitts models model, model the neurons as Boolean threshold units performing propositional logic, but they didn't have a learning rule. Hebb's learning rule gave us a way to learn the weights, but it was unstable. Rosenblatt came up with an improvement, which is a variant of the Mekelo and Pitts neuron with a provably convergent learning rule. But individual perceptrons are limited in their capacity. However, multi-layer perceptrons, networks of perceptrons can model arbitrarily uh, complex Boolean functions. So the weight is minus one over here. It's not the input and the threshold is minus one. So here you can basically, the this is just as in this case, right? The X can be either zero or one, but the weight is minus one out here. And so when X is zero, you know, 
That's right. But then our brain is not Boolean, right? We have real inputs. We don't, we don't walk through life in a Boolean haze. We get real inputs and we make non-Boolean inferences and predictions. So how does one explain that with this little model? For that, let's go back to the perceptron. Except now, instead of these inputs being Boolean, let's assume these are real valued. These weights are also real valued. The operation remains the same. The perceptron fires, meaning it outputs a one if the weighted sum of inputs exceeds a threshold. Otherwise, it doesn't. It outputs a zero. I can rewrite it. I can say that the perceptron computes an affine function of the input. And if the affine function of the input is positive, it outputs a one. Otherwise, it outputs a zero. So does anybody know the difference between an affine function and a linear function? Anyone? There could be a bias. It's just the bias term, right? So if I have summation wi xi, this is a linear combination. And what I mean by this is if I say summation wi xi equals zero, that is the equation of a of a linear, of a line that goes through origin. If I say summation wi xi plus b, this is an affine function. And when I say summation wi xi plus b equals zero, this will still give me a line, but that line will no longer go through origin. So the difference between linear and affine just lies in the presence of a bias term. That clear to everybody? Raise your hands if you got that. So keep raising your hands, guys, because I want to see if uh, and, uh, several of you need 200 yeses. This is going to keep coming up, right? Okay, I'm not quite getting to 200. Anyways, so here, this affine combination is this weighted sum of inputs plus a bias. And if I say the bias is minus t, then that's, that just gives you summation wixi minus t, right? So here's the model for the perceptron. If the affine combination of inputs is positive, it outputs a one, otherwise it outputs a zero. So now, once you model it like this, we can also make some minor changes. So the neuron performs in a two-step manner. First, it computes an affine combination, then it applies a threshold activation to it. A threshold activation is a function that outputs a one when its input is positive and zero otherwise. And so this, like this, these two figures are the same, except that this one here and this one here are the same, except that here I'm sort of recasting it as a two-step process, first computing an affine function of the inputs and then applying a threshold activation to it. But once I do it that way, I can make other modifications. I can say I compute an affine function and then I apply some other function to this affine function, like a sigmoid which is a smoother version of a threshold activation. And this too is a perceptron. Or more generally, I can see, I can say the perceptron computes a, a, an affine function of the inputs and then applies some function to this affine value. So now let's see how this works, right? I'm going to continue assuming a threshold activation. So here is my perceptron. It computes a weighted sum of the inputs. If it exceeds a threshold, the output is one, otherwise it's zero. So if you look at the points where the, the uh, weighted sum exactly matches the threshold, as we saw, that's the equation of a hyperplane. In two dimensions, that would be a line. So if this is the input space being shown, then this line shows the boundary where the weighted sum exactly matches the threshold. For all inputs on one side of the boundary, the output will be one. For all inputs on the other side, the output will be zero. So for example, if your perceptron had only two inputs, this function is going to look like this step function, uh, which basically is zero. It's called a heavy side function, which is a zero until a line. And then once the input goes past the line on the other side, the output is a one. 
And now you can see why this perceptron can compute Boolean functions, right? If I compose a perceptron of this kind and the inputs are Boolean, then Boolean inputs will only lie on one of these four dots. Any perceptron for which the boundary lies over here, what is this perceptron going to compute? What is the Boolean function it computes? Anybody? Or. or. This is an or, this is an and, and this would be? What is the last one? The last one is ignoring x2, right? And it's a not. When x1 is 0, the output is 1. When x1 is 1, the output is 0, right? So it's not x1. Uh, and uh, so, Pemi, what was the uh, question? You have a clarification. What makes the MLP and MLP good? It's, uh, a multi-layer perceptron is just a network of perceptrons. So once you begin connecting perceptrons, it becomes an MLP. That's all. Anyway, once we know how to compose this boundary, you can do some pretty amazing things. Let's see. Now, suppose I want to build a circuit which outputs a one for inputs inside the pentagon and a zero elsewhere. How would I do it? Very simple. I'm going to have one neuron which captures this lower boundary, this perceptron. I'll, I'll switch between the words neuron and perceptron because again, perceptrons model neurons, right? So I'll have one neuron which models this lower boundary. It outputs a one when the input is in the yellow region and a zero when it's below that line. I'll have another perceptron for this line, a third one for this line, a fourth one for this line, a fifth one for this line, right? So I have five perceptrons, one for each of these lines. And then when I sum their outputs, all of them will have a output one only when the input is inside the pentagon. Everywhere else, at least one of them is going to be outputting a zero. So now I can have a final perceptron, which is just performs an and. It compares the sum of the, these values to the threshold five. If the sum matches five, it's going to fire. And voila, you actually have a pentagonal decision boundary. Is this making sense to you guys? Raise your hands if that made sense. Okay, very easy, right? And so here's what, one, slow by your hands, guys. So now, once I know how to compose a pentagon, I can compose more complex decision boundaries. Suppose I want a decision boundary of this kind, this double pentagon. I will have one subnetwork which computes the lower pentagon, another subnetwork which computes the upper pentagon. I'm going to or their two outputs, and the result is a network which is going to output a one if the input, input it lies in either of these pentagons. Beautiful. I can compose even more complex decision boundaries like this one. Can anybody tell me how you would compose this decision boundary? Anyone? Anyone want to guess? Or should I invoke somebody? Um... Yeah, like you can break down the polygons into smaller parts. I you think. can break it down into many small polygons, right? And then just or the lot. So you can see, you can compose pretty much any decision boundary using a multi-layer perceptron. So now if you're performing classification, for example, if you're looking at pictures of this kind and deciding if this is the number two or not, then what is classification? When you're performing classification, you're getting some high dimensional input. For example, uh, if you are getting images of this kind, this is an image with 784 pixels. It's from the MNIST database. So the network is getting a 784 dimensional input. And so there is a boundary in the 784 dimensional space where everything within the boundary can be reliably called a two and everything outside can be called a one, call, call, can be called a digit that's not a, some image. That's not two, right? And so all you need is this MLP that captures that decision boundary. And as we just saw, since we can compose MLPs for pretty much any decision boundary at all, you should be able to compose an MLP for this boundary as well. 
In other words, MLPs can classify real value inputs and MLPs are universal classifiers. What I mean by this is that you give me a classification problem and I promise you that it's possible to construct an MLP that will perform that classification to the kind of accuracy that you want. So MLPs are universal classifiers. So the story so far, MLPs are con connectionist computational models. Individual perceptrons are computational equivalents of neurons. The MLP is a layered composition of many perceptrons and MLPs can model Boolean functions. They can act, individual perceptrons would not act as gates and networks of perceptrons are Boolean functions. But they're also Boolean machines are you know, universal classifiers. Basically they represent Boolean functions over linear boundaries. They can represent arbitrary decision boundaries and can be used to classify data. So here's another point. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, let me stop this. The correct answer is seven. Why? Because you're speaking of a hexagon, right? So for the hexagon, you would need six perceptrons to capture each of the lines. And then don't forget this final output perceptron to combine their outputs together to give you an output, right? So this is going to be, uh, you would need seven neurons, six for the boundaries and one for the final output. That makes sense to everybody? Raise your hands if it did. Yeah, perfect. All right. But then what about continuous valued functions? Your inputs may be real valued, right? So, but, your, but what about the outputs? Are the outputs restricted to be Boolean or discrete? No. Now you can actually use MLPs to also model continuous valued functions. To see this, see how, let's start with this very simple three unit MLP, where the final output perceptron only just sums everything and uses no threshold at all, right? So this first perceptron fires, meaning it outputs a one if the input exceeds threshold P1. The second perceptron fires if its input exceeds threshold T2. Let's assume T2 is greater than P1. So if I sum their two outputs with weights one and minus one respectively, when the input is less than T1, neither of these will fire, so the output is zero. When the input lies between T1 and T2, the first neuron will fire, but the second one won't, so the output is one. When the input is greater than T2, both of them will fire, they will cancel themselves out because this one has a weight of minus one and the output is zero. So this little circuit is going to generate this function where the output is one when the input lies between T1 and T2 and zero elsewhere. But now, once I can compute one of these little pulses, you give me an arbitrary function, say like this blue curve, and I can approximate it as the sum of many small steps. And I can approximate it to arbitrary precision. So each step will require two neurons. So basically I will have two neurons for each of these little rect square box rectangular boxes. And by having a large enough number of those, I can actually approximate this blue curve to arbitrary precision. To increase the accuracy, I will reduce the width of these boxes and increase the number of these boxes. So yeah, we're assuming these are Boolean T1 and the, the, it's still a standard perceptron, right? So, all I will need to do is to scale the output of, so remember each pair is going to produce an output one. So over here, I'm going to scale these, the weight associated with these two guys is going to be the function value in this region. 
the weight associated with these two guys is going to be the function value in this region and so on. So by scaling the outputs of these neurons and summing them up, I can, come, I can approximate any continuous valued function at all to arbitrary precision. So uh, we are still speaking only of threshold activations. We'll get to uh, other things, but the basic concept still holds, right? In the sense that regardless of whether this is a threshold activation uh, uh, or whether it's a sigmoid activation, the point is you give me an arbitrary function, I can compose a network that will approximate it to arbitrary precision. So does this make sense? Raise your hands again, guys, just once. To answer the question on complex value networks, we keep talking about reals because complex arithmetic is not like real arithmetic. Complex, you know, differentiability becomes a problem. And so how you learn functions becomes an issue we are not going to deal with learning till next week. Anyway, so I'm assuming this made sense. So here's a fourth form. And this is to answer the question who asked about anything other than threshold activations, right? Okay, I'll stop this. The answer is none of the above. You need only one neuron, right? To answer UA, uh, okay, here, going back here, look at this. I'm trying to model this blue curve, correct? So I can approximate this blue curve by the sequence of red boxes. Do you agree, UA? Let's say yes or no, so I can, okay. This first red box can be obtained using two neurons, correct? So I will have two neurons producing a, a box of height one, but then the weight associated with the output of the, their output is going to be H1. So these connections will have weight H1. That is going to give me at this point, this scaled box. The second two neurons is going to give me a box of height one in this range. I'm going to apply a weight H2 to those and those are going to get, that, that is going to get scaled up to here. And so piece by piece by piece for every little segment, I can add two neurons over here and have the height of the function as the output weight. And they will all add up out here. And that's going to give me this approximated blue function. Does that make sense, UA? Yes or no? This is just an addition. It's, it's, just, summing, it's just summing all of these output nips, outputs, that's it. So this is not a stand, this is, there, there's no threshold. You can think of this as just doing this, you know, just an addition, that's not a perceptron, term, right? So we'll get into more into this later, but then to add to the lessons we've seen so far, MLPs can also model continuous valued functions. So uh, this one, uh, so, okay. Can you take that to Piazza or let's, uh, uh, so, uh, Ciara and Lokesh, Lokesh were just, let's return to that question once I finish the lecture so others can leave if they want to, right? We're going to run out of time in two minutes. So MLPs, to add to everything that we saw, MLPs can also model continuous valued functions. What else can they do? It turns out that if you begin connecting neurons in loops like these, they can model memory. It turns out neural networks can model probability distributions over integers, real value, real, and even complex value domains. They can model a posteriori and a priori distributions. They can generate data from complicated and even unknown distributions. And this last thing I just like to have, you know, anytime you find something stupid going on, it's probably an Indian doing it. 
turns out there's a competition for rubbing your stomach and patting your head at the same time. And this guy is, yeah, he's a champion. Anyway, so here's what we've seen. Uh, the network is a function given an input. It computes the function layer wise. The network itself is a function given an input. This function is computed layer wise to predict an output. More generally, given one or more inputs, it predicts it can predict one or more outputs. And so going back to the first thing we asked, what are these boxes? Every one of these operations is a function. They're taking in an input and producing an output. What is a mathematical operation that takes in an input and produces an output? It's a function, right? So it takes in a voice signal, produces a transcription, an image. It gets converted to a caption. It takes in one game state and computes the next game state. So these are all functions. Functions can be modeled by neural networks. And so every one of these tasks can in fact be performed by a neural network. And so to, to close for today, interesting AI tasks are functions that can be modeled by a network. And that's why MLPs are able to perform these jobs. So in today's lessons, we went through a brief history of neural networks, introduced connectionism, uh, saw some early models and their limitations. We introduced model neural networks and what they can compute. There's a more detailed list of lessons from the lecture that will be put up on Piazza. Please verify that you've got all of those, if not post questions. And that's that. In, on Thursday's class, we will talk more about neural networks as universal approximators. Uh, any questions? All right, so let me answer this poll question, right? Oh. Uh, the poll question, the poll question was supposed to be on the slide. I'm not sure why it's not on the slide. Can you see the poll? Now, we want to produce y, uh, uh, the activation function is sine of z, right? Right. We should be able to see the poll, right? So the activation function is sine of z, right? It releases, they can see it. Okay, perfect. So I can write sine of, we want cos of 2z, 2x. That's the function you want, which is sine of 2x plus pi over 2, correct? And so I can just have the weight 2, the bias is pi over 2. This is my affine, and then I have sine. And that's going to give me my network. MLPs are universal approximators. The reason we are saying they're universal approximators are this, that they are able to model universal Boolean functions. They are able to be, they are able to model any classification boundary. And they're able to, we'll go, we'll spend more time on this. They're able to model, when it comes to continuous valued functions, you may not be able to model exactly, but then, you know, you can model it to arbitrary precision. These two are not the same, right? So for example, I can, over here, you can see that the error is pretty gross. But then I can reduce the error by making those boxes narrower and narrower and narrower. And so in the limit, you give me an upper bound on the error and I can, uh, I can uh, compute an MLP, design, construct an MLP for it. Robert, what's the question? One, a neuron doesn't compute the weights. A neuron has, this is what the neuron has, right? So the neuron, this is a single neuron. It has weights associated with every input and it has a bias. So the Ws and the B are intrinsic to the neuron. Which one? So what would the one that still be a two? Which is two? 